Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The Library's Role in the Open Research Ecosystem, which is sponsored by Ex Libris, part of Clarebate. Um, today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. Uh, all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. Uh, we've got that taken care of for you. Uh, in the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. This is primarily a panel discussion, so they will be brief. Mm -hmm. um, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our presenters. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Uh, you can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions that you like. Uh, also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we're ready to get started. So I will pass it over to Jessica. Great, thanks so much, Sabrina. And thanks so much to all of you who are joining us. I'm really excited to be part of the panel today. I'll just be moderating. Um, and I've been with Ex Libris for almost four years now as part of the research solutions team. And before then, I was an academic librarian for about 10 years. So this is an issue that I am very, very interested in and excited about. Um, I, I think that it's timely for quite uh, a few reasons. Um, and really the COVID pandemic is a great example of open research and utilizing open infrastructure to solve a crisis as quickly as possible. Um, the speed of scientific discovery and advancement has rapidly, excuse me, um, has really rapidly um, increased. For example, the full genome of COVID-19 was published barely a month after the first case was admitted to the Wuhan hospital. Uh, and it was presented as an open access publication in the Lancet. Open research is reaching the highest levels of global leadership, including the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or OECD, for example. Another reason that I think this is really important is that Open research isn't necessarily just for the STEM disciplines. Uh, if we compare, I, I was surprised to learn recently that as a result of the COVID pandemic, open research is becoming more the norm in psychology. For example, uh, Dr. Christantis, who's a science program officer at the APA, she's been quoted as saying, with school closures and conferences going virtual, many people started relying on open science tools for the first time. That was not a result of the pandemic that I was expecting to hear when I was preparing for this webinar. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, this trend in openness and sharing from various perspectives and disciplines really is growing. The support that organizations, including libraries, must provide to ensure the future success of open research has to pivot to accommodate these new modalities. And we know that based on many, many studies that have been conducted that researchers don't regularly exercise their right to self archive their scholarship. We know that researchers have many burdens on their time and we know how important all research is in advancing knowledge and understanding of our world. Today's panel of experts will shed light on what problems we can solve, what it will take to do that and why this issue is so critical uh, to understand and to work on. So today I'm pleased to introduce our speakers who have really rich views and perspectives on this topic uh, that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, first is Brian Minihan from ORCID. Then we have Joan Kalarik from Drexel University. We have Shalhavet Bar Asher, my colleague from Ex Libris, and Wendy Robertson from the University of Iowa. Um, Brian, could you start by introducing yourself and your organization quickly, please, or briefly? <laughs> Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Minahan. Um, I'm with uh, ORCID. Um, I've been with ORCID for about four years. Uh, I'm known as an engagement lead, so I'm the public face of ORCID to the community. Um, so you may have 
uh, kind of seen me on webinars and town halls and things. Uh, I've just recently relocated back to the States from Hong Kong about two months ago. Uh, so I have quite a lot of background working with uh, Asia Pacific uh, research institutions and uh, now the US and Canada. Uh, before that, I was a scholarly communications librarian at Hong Kong Baptist University and uh, transitioned into being a librarian from my background in China studies uh, before that. Um, so I'm very pleased to be with you all. Um, shall we go to Joan? Would you like to tell a bit about yourself? <laughs> So Joan Kolarik, uh, I've been a librarian for many years, um, starting with corporate libraries in the 80s and moving to academic libraries in the new millennium. So I have a broad variety of experience. I even worked for Ex Libris for quite a few years. And I also recently re relocated. I left the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, which provides graduate level education and does pure research in the sciences just about a month ago. And my new location is at Drexel University, a private R1 research university in the US. Its programs cover the arts, the arts and the sciences and education begins at the undergraduate level. So I have a lot to learn about my new environment. Um, I know a bit about US practice, but I'll I also have a lot to learn there because most of my background in open access has been acquired uh, in while I was in Israel and in uh, centers in the European arena, not, actually not uh, Israel specifically. Um, so while both Weizmann and Drexel are as plural customers, I also have worked with uh, other research information systems and institution, institutional repository products such as Pure and Bpress. So kind of a broad uh, background and I love to look at how systems integrate with each other and open access is just part of that picture. On to Wendy. Hi, uh, I'm Wendy Robertson. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Institutional Repository and Metadata Librarian at the University of Iowa. Uh, the University of Iowa is a public research institution in the Big Ten Academic Alliance. We have strong medical program and also strong writing program. So both sciences and humanities and of course social sciences are very important to us. I work with our institutional repository and journal publishing, particularly regarding metadata, persistent identifiers, preservation, and equity of access. I work closely with the scholarly communications, scholarly impact, and data services librarians. We migrated from Digital Commons to Esploro for our IR and uh, to Janeway for our journals. We use Esploro for our data sets, and we were development partners for Esploro and the first customer to go live. We register our DOIs with both DataCite and Crossref, and we are ORCID members. And so now on to Shell Hebbett. Thanks, Wendy. So I'm Shell Hebbett Barasher. I'm based in Jerusalem, Israel. And if you're wondering what my unusual name means, so it means the flame of a candle in Hebrew. I'm VP Research Information Management at Exlibris, which is now part of Clarivate, and I'm managing the Exploro business. And that's part of our research and discovery unit, which also means that my team and I work closely with teams that are managing other research products in the company, uh, such as Web of Science, Insights, Converis, and Pivot RP, and looking at you know, what, what we can do to bring additional solutions to the market. Back Wonderful, here. thanks so much, everyone. Uh, I, you all have so much to offer uh, in terms of your responses in this space and all of the work that you're doing on a daily basis. My first question though is to Joan. Not everyone here really knows, I, I'm not assuming that the audience knows every single answer to every single question. So I thought maybe you could help us understand what the ways that libraries are currently uh, contributing to advancing open science. So what are some of the activities that libraries can do? And what plans do you have to extend your library support in the open research space? Well, um, I think the first thing you have to have in place is some good tools. And without being specific about what they should be, uh, a, a, good uh, institutional repository product is really fundamental because you need some kind of basis from which to work 
Um, and a standard ILS library integrated system is not necessarily uh, sufficient. And um, one of the things I just want to say, I was really impressed by the diversity of the registration. Uh, people from all over the world here. And in that first uh, survey that we did, I saw quite a people who, in answer to the question, what's your organization doing, said, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I have to, my second thing would be outreach and going out and talking to the researchers, perhaps starting with them, talking to the research office and um, finding out what is needed because that's where any, in any organization, that's what you can do best. You can serve a need. Um, if you have a wonderful solution, but nobody needs it, who, it's gonna be really hard to sell. Um, so, so for those, people who are asking themselves what to do. I think that's the, a really important point too, is the outreach as well. And I'm in a new organization, so I have to do a lot of outreach and learning of tools and networks and you know requirements, what's going on. Um, so I'll be doing all that myself over the next few months as well. Um, and I could mention a whole bunch of other things, but I know that Wendy has a really good list. So I'm gonna pass off to her. Thanks, Joan. So yeah, you mentioned institutional repositories, and of course, that's something we've used for a long time uh, to support author-facilitated open access through preprints and accepted manuscripts, and as well as gray literature, uh, like uh, working papers and, and reports. Um, we also, as a library, support open research through money. We, we support various publishing models, various um, tools, and that varies how much any institution can provide that support, but that's something we, we really are trying to support monetarily as well as through staff time. Um, ORCID is something we've done a lot of work with at Iowa. We, uh, quite a few years ago, worked with our central I, um, IT to get it into the directory so that you can um, connect ORCID to our, our directory. And this has been particularly successful at the University of Iowa because of the College of Medicine where it was required, not by the library, but by the Dean of the College of Medicine. So many, most people have ORCIDs and many of them are connected to the directory. So we can hopefully have more of a trust relationship with ORCID. Uh, at this point, I don't think we're writing any information to ORCID like uh, education or um, uh, employment yet. Uh, we support open research by making sure we register DOIs for locally produced content, particularly our journals, but also locally published journals. Uh, our systems now do this much more easily. We, it had been a, not an easy uh, solution in the in what I'd been using previously, but both Esploro and Janeway do this very easily for us. And, and many other systems do this. Wasn't meant as a specific plug. It's just hopefully the tools are mature enough and, and it may be that Digital Commons does it easily as well now, but you know, watching as the tools are getting, getting more mature to allow us to support open research easily has been uh, helpful. We have people that support, uh, have data management expertise and they help work with researchers to try to help with open research in that way and submitting data to an appropriate repository, which may or may not be our institutional repository. And then one of the reasons we migrated to Esploro was that we decided that the university needed an authoritative list of publications that could be repurposed elsewhere by individual researchers and that we could correct this data as needed. And we determined this was an appropriate role for the library given our metadata and index tools expertise. So this is something we could be, this is where we should be doing something for the university. And so we hope that these will start going to ORCID and to other places. Um, we haven't, we are still developing this database. Other libraries are ahead of us using a variety of tools, but this is something many libraries can do. Uh, I also work with our journal publishing and I want to note that the people doing journal publishing need to be thinking about all of these things as well to make sure there's the identifiers of DOIs, ORCIDs, and ROARs, which are institutional identifiers for the authors, and as well as grant funding information, and ideally including citation lists of what has been cited when you register your DOIs with Crossref, so that then you can get the citation counts that we want in other publications. Uh, we are not doing all of this. That's in part because the humanities titles, it's not as it's not as uh, smooth a fit there in some ways, but it's also because 
our systems do not always make this the easiest uh, thing to do yet. And we have not done much with our grants office, but I know many other institutions have worked with them. Uh, and I think that's another area that the libraries, uh, partnership that the libraries could have with within the university. I love that you're already mentioning some of the partners and all of that community engagement. One more question for you, Wendy and Joan, is what do you think some of the most valuable advancements have been in this space over the years? So what are some things that are working really well? I'll start with a few. Um, one of my personal favorites are the persistent identifiers because it's really kind of the, 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 all those connecting points. Uh, but also open systems with APIs, uh, things like cross-ref metadata search and everything our research has been doing. All of these have been so helpful and people can build on them. And if they're um, using the data in an open way, so having the data be open with tools that are open. Uh, the growth and freely available scholarship and the ways the libraries have helped these efforts with money, I think is another huge advancement. But the two final ones are, I think that researchers understanding the importance of open research and making things available and libraries, librarians um, thinking really creatively about working with researchers to rethink the entire research and publishing flow. So these are just people really being create, coming up with creative solutions to open research issues. Joan, I'm sure you have more to add. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of, echo, well, my first one kind of echoes what Wendy said, which is, um, in the terms of money, the, the fact that publishers are finally coming up with some real transformational or even better proper uh, read and publish agreements is huge. It's, it's very important. And, and all the experimentation with other types like um, subscribe to publish, so, sorry, subscribe to open and things like that um, are really important. And that's just so much is happening. It's hard to keep up right now, but I can't say it's where it needs to be, but it's definitely some really great, uh, a good direction. Um, and another one is together with that uh, option of having more and more open access coming from the publishers, systems to maintain and to monitor APCs, article processing charges. In other words, the tokens that the publishers are giving us as no matter who's working with that, somebody needs to monitor who's getting them, what the value is, that it's properly, correctly processed and identified. It's, it's, it's unfortunately a complex area. And so the emerging um, support for, with software for that function as well is something that's very nice. And the, third, the last one that I would mention is the uh, grant and compliance support which has been made possible by having a good research information system uh, because the, for example, in where I used to work, the, the European community, the uh, increasingly strict application of the grant uh, requirements in terms of open access for the articles and now moving into data management, has made it very difficult for researchers to keep track of what their obligations are. And the library has a huge opportunity helping them understand. And so the fact that the good research information systems can provide the tools to do that is also a very important, especially as things are, you know, it's a very difficult environment right now for the researchers to understand. Yeah. And I think that's an indication of how many one, how complex this issue is, also how important it is because there are so many different individuals and organizations working at various levels to support this. And my next question is for uh, the, the folks outside of the academy, uh, the, the partners, I think, and it's more about how these you know, how are organizations and vendors helping to facilitate metadata reuse and what use cases get you excited from the, the solution perspective? Um, Brian, maybe you can address that first. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say first and foremost, the, um, the vendors or the, you know, providers of these platforms uh, and information um, 
uh, if you if you want open research, then you have to have your metadata and your systems be somewhat open as well. So they need to communicate with each other. Um, my organization, ORCID, uh, is pretty young, um, but essentially it's useful because it's based on interacting with other systems. Uh, Wendy and Joan both mentioned Crossref, and that's really the source of a huge amount of data uh, in ORCID. So, uh, however many publishers, uh, sorry, uh, researchers published, uh, that a lot of that data came through Crossref when the DOI for their publication was created and then uh, got inserted to ORCID. So uh, how systems can help is to, um, to ensure that the metadata is, is um, interoperable. Uh, that's actually kind of the point of persistent identifiers uh, is that they're um, one that they, they don't suffer link rot and that they, they also uh, communicate uh, with each other. Um, so having said that, it is, it is hard because uh, you know, things change quite quick and uh, you can't predict the future. Um, so you, you, you just, I would have to say, try your best to be, um, to be open and communicate with each other about what you're doing and um, try not to be a, a beta max uh, and things and build something that will go obsolute. In, in two years. Um, I don't know, um, what do you, any thoughts, um, Michelle Levitt, on this? Well, first of all, I very much agree with what you said about, you know, vendors having to collaborate, um, having data openly, you know, uh, exchangeable between systems. Um, looking at two different aspects here, the first one is we're seeing a demand to move from, let's call it a print, era business model where each subscriber is paying for what they're using to a digital era model where one party is paying and sharing um, or what Wendy was calling repurposing. So, you know, open access is leveraging existing journal infrastructure to get us closer to that newer model of, of reusing. Another step is then implementing the open access within institutional repositories. And of course, to that end, it's also important to make sure that it's easy to deposit work into institutional repositories. Another angle here is um, Wendy's favorite, the persistent identifiers. So, you know, PIDs and metadata sharing are really critical to make sure that the data is discoverable. Whether it's being discovered, you know, in Google Scholar, or on an, in a repository, in a, in a discovery tool, in a homegrown solution, um, and to this end, in Esploro, we support multiple PIDs. Where possible, we bring them in automatically. Uh, we also support the use of ROR identifiers, so research organization registry. And we also register DOIs to Crossref and to Datasite um, and automatically send updates if the metadata changes. So this makes the data reuse even easier. That sounds great but I wanna hear about what vendors and organizations should be focusing on to enable better workflows and reduced friction. So I guess, you know, Wendy and Joan, maybe you can give us some advice. Well, no surprise that I'll start with um, <laughs> persistent identifiers, but along with those actually having accurate metadata that's complete, um, you, you don't wouldn't think that would be so hard to ask for, but unfortunately that is missing in a lot of cases. Uh, and then ORCIDs and ROARs, we need both of those because so many people have similar names and trying to find publications by our people. This is why we really need ORCIDs in publications so we can identify publications by our people. We also want APIs that work seamlessly and don't require much knowledge to set up. Um, we just kind of want it to work. <laughs> so few people have the time or knowledge to uh, know all of those systems. And we just kind of want it all to work together uh, without any issues. I, I mean, I know that's a lot to ask, but we <laughs> kind of are looking forward to all of the systems nicely working together. I would, um, really appreciate when organizations, institutions, uh, vendors are participants in developing standards and maintenance of those standards and keeping them current so, so that you can 
give your input onto them and also be using them. And so I think the standards community is another really huge area to make sure people, uh, uh, organizations are involved in. As far as some other gaps in metadata, clarity of versions and relationships, these are big problems. Um, like when we get metadata from archive, it doesn't necessarily indicate it's a preprint, which it kind of typically is. So that kind of information would be helpful or linking to a data set would be really nice to have that link to the data set and have that relationship in there uh, or the code that was used. So making all of those relationships between different parts of the research um, having all of that connected through identifiers would be incredibly helpful. And part of that is for people with the data set so they can see the data set has been cited and used on other. Um, and sometimes this is clear on a publisher site, but it may not be included in the shared metadata. Um, who the authors are and who the corresponding authors are starts getting to be a bigger issue the more authors there are. And also who might have paid for the um, article pro processing charge. Uh, that's a useful piece of information so that how much money has the University of Iowa spent, not through the libraries, but across the university. And so if we enter into a new, uh, a different kind of deal, what kind of money would the University of Iowa be saving? And we can talk to our provost for uh, maybe some other funding because this could help the university as a whole. Um, and then of course, making sure that the roles, all the roles are included because not everyone is an author. And there's a credit taxonomy is really great to give people more, more people that are contributing, giving them, um, acknowledging the work done by everyone. But we should also clarify who is doing what work. So we need these roles to come in with the metadata. And that means even on publications with, a lot of authors, and this will be very challenging for some of these thousand art, um, author articles. And also one final reminder that the humanities exist. And while a lot of this is open science and we're thinking about science, we need to be making sure a lot of these models can work with the humanities, which as Joan said, is talking to the people in the humanities because their needs are different and we want to build systems that will work for them and their needs as well. So, um, Pass it on to Joan. Um, and, and, and Jessica might have to stop me because I can go on about this for way too long. Um, and I just want to say, by the way, kind of echoing some of the things that um, Wendy said, that the, the, the point about metadata, I just want to make the point that it's easy to blame your um, research information system for metadata problems, but they usually start with the publishers and with the databases that are moving the you know metadata through the system and any software can only work with what they're given so it's really important that these systems work together uh so that just that was one and and um oh my god so many <laughs> issues uh mentioning the roles thing that it's it's also important it, i mean it could be important but it's too hard to manage right now that for young researchers as they do their tenure reviews, if there was some way to consistently record that role or that participation in the researcher, that could be a very helpful marketing point for the researchers, but it's, it's that, that data is not there right now. Um, and uh, <sighs> So the better integration of grant information, for example, would really help with uh, grant compliance monitoring. That's for both the publishers, again, and the software vendors. Um, it's a, a lot of the issues that need to be mentioned are, are basically issues of, of metadata transference between the publishers and software vendors. I think I can't say, say that enough times. Um, the APC monitoring, the, the fact that there's, as far as I know, no publisher Wiley was starting to can accurately indicate when there's two or three corresponding authors. And so there's opportunities for open access tokens being used by someone other than the first author that are just getting lost and no, it's very hard to find the time to monitor things like that. There's, 
again, I can just go on and on about the problems in the metadata that's that's getting transferred to us, to the to the libraries who are trying to help manage this. Um, so I should probably stop. <laughs> yeah. But I think some of the things that you just described really shows how complex this issue is. And you're not just trying to solve a problem for an individual researcher. There's the department, uh, the college, the university, all of the university stakeholders, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders. So what should the organizations and vendors outside of your organizations do to help alleviate some of these problems? I mean, Chavet, um, maybe you can get us started in that area. Sure. Well, that was a long list. I know. <laughs> uh, but I'll, uh, I'll touch on some of those points and, and talk a bit about things we've done recently and some plans that we have in this area. And, um, you know, kind of taking a step back, we're, we're talking a lot, of course, about, um, about metadata, but right, this discussion is in the context of open research and serving the purpose of researchers and students being able to easily access full text. And what we're doing, some of what we're doing to that end is, first of all, having um, simple open APIs, I guess, you know, we can argue about how simple they are, but um, open APIs, permissive data reuse policy, supporting standards like OAI PMH uh, for metadata harvesting, so we want to make sure that there are different ways that make it easy for data to be exported and imported and reused between systems. And you know, uh, Brian and I both spoke at the beginning about how important it is really for to, uh, for data to be transferable between systems. And then we're also investing in a good user experience. So you know, we want to make sure that users can land at a free to read version. It might be through um, open access metadata. It might be through link resolvers. It might be through institutional repositories. And um, more specifically in Esploro, we recently, uh, sorry, we integrated with, um, with Oable for APC request creation. Um, and more recently, we worked together with, uh, with Brian and his colleagues at ORCID to uh, be able to push Esploro assets to ORCID. Um, we're also looking to do this soon in the other direction and to be able to do this um, for additional uh, researcher details. And this way, both systems can have more complete profiles without you know, the burden of double data entry in the system. So those are just a few of the things we're doing. Um, Brian, how about you? Um, yeah, those are excellent, excellent points. I, when speaking about this, sometimes I, I think it's good uh, in, in relation to Wendy and Joan's uh, opening too, to, you know, there are issues with IRs or, you know, ORCID and, and publisher metadata. But in my view, uh, one of the things that frustrates me, and I'm sure it does researchers uh, as well, is looking at the whole research uh, ecosystem. Some systems and environments are more advanced than others. So to, in, in my uh, view, uh, universities and publishers are actually pretty, pretty well ahead of the game in, in sharing metadata and having interoperable systems. Where I find a huge uh, blank space is with research funding and with, uh, say, conference platforms and, you know, to say nothing of the humanities, which I think uh, Wendy can, can speak of too. But these are, I don't, I don't know, these are areas where there's not as much maturity with systems. There's a huge balkanized environment. Uh, I think every conference I've submitted or attended to, there's a different platform. <laughs> so there's no sharing of, nobody remembers me like, oh, Brian, yes, you, you presented at, at our thing two years ago, nothing like that. So this is a source of frustration for me and I'm sure it is to uh, other researchers. Um, and hopefully um, I think librarians, are really keen observers of the environment and they, they can serve the research community by observing um, uh, developments uh, in, that, um, in that realm. What, if something comes into play that, that links the other parts of the research um, cycle. Brian, maybe Thanks. while while you're on the topic, would you be able to share a little bit more about persistent identifiers? You know what they are, just to make sure that everybody's clear on what we're talking about. 
And also what role specifically do they play in an open research ecosystem? Why are they so important? Yeah, um, good point. Uh, persistent identifiers, uh, we hear this a lot, uh, commonly called PIDs. Uh, so these are um, identifiers with a prefix and a suffix. So they have a structure, no matter uh, what kind of, um, where they come from or what their purpose is. So the most uh, common persistent identifier to most people is the DOI, uh, the digital object identifier, uh, which really helped, um, you know, kind of cement um, a published work. And now we have used DOIs for quite a lot of things, data, data sets uh, and other things. Um, and that's really quite a mature persistent identifier, um, uh, a DOI. But so those are four works or objects. Uh, another persistent identifier uh, that I work with a lot uh, at ORCID is uh, an ORCID ID. So that's a persistent identifier for an individual or a person. Um, where a lot of work is going on nowadays is uh, I think Wendy mentioned uh, ROAR, so Registry of Repositories. This is an organization ID. So this is attempting to solve the problem of, uh, is it University of Texas Austin Library or is it you know, such and such uh, Homer Simpson Memorial Library and, and things like that. Uh, attempting to solve the, the name problem of organizations, which is a huge challenge. Um, there are quite a lot of organization IDs out there. Uh, people may know Ringgold from the serials um, um, days, but um, Roar is, uh, kind of the front runner at the moment. And a lot of organizations, I think Shalabit mentioned that uh, Esploro and Ex Libris is working with them. The function that they do and why they're so important to open research is they, um, they are persistent. So they, they don't go away. Uh, they carry uh, metadata with them and a schema that will always be there. So that metadata associated with the persistent identifier will always be uh, reachable in some way or fashion. Um, yeah. Um, Joan, do you have uh, you have anything to add from that from your experience? Um, oh, once again, I can go on about <laughs> way too long. Um, I would just like to 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 say um, about Orchid specifically that um, the increasing visibility of Orchid links in articles um, and either in the landing page or um, on the PDF, I think will make ORCIDs much more marketable to researchers because we can go to many researchers and say, here's your article, look at that little green dot next to your name. Everybody who clicks on it gets to a page that shows your name and nothing else. Where's your list of articles? Why aren't you? Why aren't we syncing from the institution from the uh, research information system to fill up that list so that when people click on your name, they'll get the curated list that you want them to see. And I, I think this, as I said, I think it's an amazing uh, opportunity. Uh, publishers like ACS, they put the links at the end of the art PDF. Sage, I found recently, I, had, I could share some links if somebody wants to know what I'm talking about, if you haven't noticed this, um, also puts the uh, links on the landing pages and it, I, there's more, many more examples. So that's one really useful uh, job that the PIDs are doing in the uh, research environment, helping to connect between the current article and the author's full, potentially full list. Um, and another one, if you'll forgive me, perhaps taking a controversial, controversial stand, um, I think publishers are wasting way too much time trying to put the department of every single researcher in the article. I mean, it's very nice to have that in as full text, but if the if the journals would simply put in a, one of pick one of the PIDs and like Roar or Ringgold or whatever, and link to the organization, organizations have enough trouble keeping track of their own departments. Journals shouldn't be doing it and passing on that problematic information to libraries and to other systems. Um, so it would be amazing if the the current state of the organizational persistent identifier could be improved 
once again, starting at the publisher level. Um, I, that's probably enough, perhaps uh, back to you, Jessica. Yeah, there are a lot of great questions coming into the chat. So I'm gonna ask one more question uh, before I move on to some of the audience questions. And it's really about the global experience. So open research policies, uh, open science mandates, are there any uh, things that we can learn from a global perspective? Um, well, there, for open research, there are a lot of uh, developments around the world. Um, so the um, UK Research and Innovation, UKRI, uh, has quite a lot of, um, uh, not just say, uh, rules with their funding, but also a lot of tools to follow up. And I think that's a really uh, important um, aspect of say having a mandate or a, or a policy, it's really great to have that. But if you just set the researcher free and you know, presumably the librarian who's supporting that researcher, uh, it's, it's a lot better if, if you can provide tools uh, to, uh, to help um, that researcher. So I think as librarians, we, we have a natural instinct to keep up on things. Um, but so that UKRI, um, um both the both the policy and the tools are interesting uh to me uh i know maybe uh joan knows more about this but the there is the eosc um so this is kind of a a science cloud in the in the european union so their goal is to have host a lot of uh open science and related uh, um things like data but also to um present a platform uh, and I can put the link in the chat uh, with that. Um, just lastly, I would say we've talked, touched upon APCs a, a wee bit and there, there are some developments in linking uh, APCs with uh, publications and, and kind of following it through the process. I think there's a, a platform called OA Switchboard, which is a very new one, which is coming, coming out. So it's something that, um, definitely keeping an eye on and, and seeing if that helps uh, folks keep track of who's paying an, an APC and, 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 and complying with a sort of a open access mandate, uh, both for the researcher and the institution. I wonder, Wendy, if you have any insight from the librarian perspective on that. I, I don't really have any insights, but I can just more, um give a plea to pay attention to the rest of the world we can so often in the this is a uh a, there are people me, audience members from around the world but this is a uh, u.s focused webinar and so i know there's a lot of people in the u.s here and we can be so focused on the u.s we don't see what's happening everywhere else and there's many other initiatives that are so important but this you know for for everybody the u.n sustainability Sustainable development goals are something I hear about more from colleagues not in the United States than in the US, but it's, it's something which they need to, other people are trying to connect to publications. And there's many initiatives that are, have been around the world that may not be from the US, but have, have, have had a quite a bit of impact on us, such as Plan S um, in the UK, that was been influential everywhere. And then also um, not library specific, but when GDPR came out in Europe uh, for privacy, this has been a global impact on privacy. So just look across borders. And as I'm saying that, I've been talking about the global north. So we also need to be looking at the global south because there's so many great things that are happening there. And I've been really appreciative of uh, all these online conferences because I can hear from colleagues around the world so much more easily about the things that they're doing. But the other piece of that is we need to make sure that whatever models we create and whatever we're doing, we we make it so that the, the content is accessible around the world and that people around the world can publish in uh, various venues. Because all of these things which cost, we're putting up price barriers and putting up 
other artificial barriers so we, we aren't seeing the wealth of research from around the world or requiring people to cite something that they don't have access to because it's important, uh, because it's an expensive item that they don't have, when it's more of a thing to just be cited as opposed to something that is really critical to their understanding of uh, uh, the discussion. This, this comes from um, Martin Paul Eads, uh, uh, something he had on Twitter recently, where I was thinking about that. So we, we put up all of these barriers where people in the global South are cut out of research, either because they can't read it or because they can't publish. And then we also can discount all the things that they're doing, which can make things much more equitable for everyone. So that's, that's my thoughts. On that. That's, that's really interesting. And I, I agree with you that one of the benefits of, you know, not having on site conferences is it's more affordable and accessible to hear all of those different perspectives. So uh, one of the benefits that's coming out of uh, the past two years or so of all of the, the changes globally. I mentioned that there are some really great audience questions. The first one comes from Claire Curry, and they're asking, how do you reconcile open access publications versus using proprietary software to organize it within a given university? How do you ensure that a researcher's metadata goes between systems if you switch systems? Um, and I guess the first person to jump on that can take the wheel. <laughs> I, I can start. Uh, so the open access publications and proprietary software, um, it's really, can you export the data? And if you can export the data and can you transform it to something else, then you're fine. And you can move it to another, from one proprietary system to another, or from one proprietary system to an open one. As long as you have the data, then you're good. And the more that that data is well-formed using standards, uh, the better off you are. So it's just something to look at is, we always look at things, to, what kind of exit strategy do, do we have? And then for a given researcher, it's slightly different because we may stay on the same system, but a given researcher will, can leave our institution at any time. And that's where something like ORCID comes into play because that stays with the researcher no matter which institution they're at. And so again, can we export data in a format that the researcher can use to get it to ORCID, into a CV, whatever the various form is into um, a grant agency's uh, structured. Um, and let me just say, you know, I might be able to build myself a small table but without standards and without professional knowledge, but building a house, I think might be a bad choice. And I think that's the comparison between OA publications and uh, uh, the software that's needed to house them because it's a complex world out there and the standards are important and relying, I'm not saying there isn't any open access software out there that's worthwhile, but it's, it's a huge challenge. And I personally prefer to have a solid company with a solid history behind the software that's used. Uh, so, and by the way, in my opinion, one should never go into any software without knowing how to get all of your data out before you start. So that's one of the first questions you should ask if you're buying software is how do I get my content out? Not just how do I get my content in? This is another question. It just came in, but it's related to what we're discussing about uh, right now. And it's, can you talk a bit about how systems and services such as ORCID can or do interface with faculty dossier systems, like a, a faculty activity reporting system, uh, for example, um, that are that's used for recording various publications, grants, awards, and things like that. So, how do all of these different systems or silos connect across the academy? API is probably the most important word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's how Orchid connects with any system. Um, if it's not an API, then it's manual data entry, which is not preferred we can all do that you know on a word document uh, in our garage if we like um so orchid communicates with i would say they're called um 
uh, research information management systems in North America. I'm still getting used. I call them Chris's uh, from being away uh, for a few years. Um, I think a lot of uh, universities uh, use a number uh, of, of these to keep track of um, you know, research activities. And to be fair, there are some systems out there which uh, specialize in um, especially grant uh, activities. So there's, um, these are mostly getting picked up. I, I know I complained about grant agencies all being uh, not talking to each other and things, but there's one system called Smart Simple, which a lot of uh, grant agencies are increasingly using. Uh, and the reason why I know about that is because they have an API with ORCID, so uh, they can um, access information from the ORCID registry and better uh, manage um, their awards and uh, follow up uh, later on from the research activity. Uh, I hope that helps someone. Um, and I would say same, yeah. you know, same for Exploro APIs that allow it to um, to receive and transfer data to different types of systems, such as some of those mentioned here. This question is a bit of a pivot, but since uh, the humanities have been mentioned, I think uh, it's, it's fair game. This question is uh, from Charles Watkinson. Uh, they say, I'd also like to find out about how libraries can support open books with their faculty authors in the systems in their direction of acquisition budgets. So how can budget help with open books? And are books different from journals in their challenges and opportunities? Well, I'll start and say Charles really should be answering this himself as the head of the University of Michigan Press. That's what I thought too, but it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna roll in a bit of the needs of the humanities. So humanities tend, there are a lot more things in the humanities that are single authored. So the single authored book, as opposed to book chapters and the creative works, um, musical performances. And those are different in the scale and how the libraries have treated them, but also in some cases you can monetize them or in other cases with musical performances, the rights clearances would be just, uh, for our graduate students they, uh, in Doctor of Musical Arts, they can do recordings, but we cannot make those recordings publicly available because the rights clearance for those musical pieces would be far too expensive and be onerous on the students graduating. So that's kind of how humanities can be different. It's just rights are different and the way people publish are different. Um, but for books, um, again, the, the cost of making a book is, is it's just a larger thing. And it doesn't, we've for years kind of subscribed to journals in an ongoing fashion and there's an expectation, but the books have been a bit different. And I think this is where the libraries are coming up with some new models and how can we support them, which is, it's a very good question. How can libraries do this? And I think it's trying these different models for how we can support uh, open books. Um, and it's for our faculty, for things um, kind of broadly, we're putting money into a variety of uh, different things to try to, to support open publishing. And sometimes it's supporting the software behind it being developed like uh, Fulcrum or um, maybe Janeway for um, being using it for books, but it could also be um, putting things into Punctum Books or some other publishing group, publishing uh, humanities materials. And the money in humanities is so small that um, it budgets traditionally, you know, your, your budget in medicine is going to be much larger than your budget buying history materials. So when we started splitting that out into journals and in different ways, the cost of a book by your one faculty member can eat up a huge percentage of your budget. So it's, you just have to think about it so differently. Um, but the books are terribly important to continue to fund. The, the last question is really nice because I suspect it might bring us to where this conversation started. And the question is, could you please elaborate on best practices around library linkages between libraries and campus research offices, research data management, and open access workflows? Joan, you're unmuted. Would you be willing to start? <laughs> 
I'm too lazy to mute. Sorry. Me. I hope I haven't make, you've been making too much noise. Um, well, I, I, at my previous position, I can say that one of our most fruitful collaborations was with the grants department uh, at our at uh, the Weizmann Institute, and it it actually kind of started out because we were both both on both sides we were trying to figure out what to do, how to help the researchers. And in getting together, we could help each other because they could explain stuff about the grants that we didn't know. And we could explain stuff about the publication process and the articles that they didn't know. And we just started meeting occasionally to say, okay, let's try this. And then like six months later, okay, that kind of worked, but maybe we should try this instead. And, and if you can find a collaboration like that, it can be really uh, helpful and seriously, where there's a need, <laughs> that's that's the best place to start. Um, and sometimes research offices don't perceive themselves as needing anything, <laughs> if you'll forgive me. Um, I hope that's not true in other places. Um, but but that's it's it's to to look for the pain points and to try and offer something. Yeah, I, if I could follow that, I I joined uh, NCURA, National Council of University uh, Research Administrators, uh, just after I moved back to the US specifically because I have a library background. So I understand, I look at things from the ALA, ACRL point of view, but I've noticed there's always a, a bit of a gap between the research managers and research administrators and the librarians, even though they're, they're often working at the same purpose. So I'm hoping that there'll be more communication between the two communities, you know, both, you know, locally at your institution and, you know, uh, regionally, nationally, globally. I think it'd be uh, a really uh, cool endeavor because as Joan said, a lot of common purpose, but sometimes you may not uh, talk to each other that much. And, you know, you obviously can learn quite a lot from each other. So. And um, a point that I can add is that, you know, the, the research office uh, would like to see, you know, a lot of the articles being published being open access. They're typically more highly cited, uh, but we all know that researchers aren't always diligent or they don't, they just don't know how to make sure that, that it's open access. And in this case, the research office can turn to the library and get their expertise in managing and supporting this. Um, I could throw in another one, which is, again, uh, something that publishers could do to be more helpful, because in working with transformational and read and publish agreements, one of the problems I kept trying to explain to the publishers over and over again was that by leaving the library out of the equation, they were getting less uptake on open access from researchers, from the authors, because the there's just so much variety out there among the publishers and the journals and the, the researchers can't keep track of that. They don't, they don't want to know all that detail. And, and for, I can say after over two years of experience at Weizmann, we almost never found a researcher who said no to publishing open access once they understood that it was free. It was through by a transformational agreement or a read and publish. But the publishers remained convinced that there was only like 80% of the authors interested. And that's, and I maintain over and over again, that's because they weren't speaking directly to the authors. They were not explaining things clearly enough. And there's a real, real place for publishers to involve libraries more. And that's not exactly to the point that you're making. And yet I feel that it's related because it's the researchers themselves. Um, that the, the library has a lot to offer in helping explain and, and broaden the uptake of open access publication in the organization. And I think that is a great way to conclude this wonderful hour that we've spent together. I see one more question um, from Jody, and it's at the end of the session, would it be possible for someone to provide a list of all of the platforms mentioned in this and tools mentioned in the session? That's something I'll. I'll work with Sabrina and see if there's, you know, a, an attachment or, or some links that we can send out with the recording. Um, but we'll try and get that to you one way or another. I know there were a few things mentioned that I had I had not yet heard of. So uh, 
that'll be a useful list for me as well. Um, so we'll definitely work on that and try and get it out to all of the registrants. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Jessica. And thank you to Joan, Wendy, Brian, and Shell Hovett for taking the time to speak with us today. And thanks to our attendees for your questions and comments. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording um, and that document as well. And also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, uh, we would really appreciate it. They, uh, your responses help improve our presentations. Uh, so thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thank you. Thanks.